Lefkowitz, and I'm a Senior Global Procurement and Sourcing Manager for Chubb Insurance and the ISM New Jersey Chairperson of our Supplier Diversity Committee. On behalf of ISM New Jersey, I'd like to welcome you all to our Supplier Diversity Program, including an exciting second annual Supplier Showcase. I would like especially to welcome and thank our corporate sponsors, our title sponsor, Daiichi Sanko, our VIP sponsor, ADP, our friend sponsors, Bravo Group Services, Prudential, Novartis, Johnson & Johnson, and um, Fair Market. Okay. We will begin today's session with, an, with um, a program by keynote speaker, Nathan Ayers, Prudential's Chief Procurement Officer, Global Sourcing and Procurement Group. Nathan's presentation will be followed by our sponsor spotlight when you will be introduced to our corporate sponsors who helped bring today's event to us. The spotlight will then be followed by our supplier showcase where four diverse suppliers, a business to business software event planning company, an architectural engineering and construction design firm, a janitorial facility support service company, and a health and wellness technology company will all have an opportunity to present their value proposition to our distinguished panel in a safe environment. And they'll receive feedback from, from our panel group, including moderator jo Joy Wong, the Corporate VP Supplier Diversity New York Life Insurance, Willie Mae Vizi, President Covenant Business Concepts, and Paul Williams, Director of Global Economic Inclusion and Supplier Diversity Mondelez. We also invite you our procurement and supplier diversity managers and other diverse suppliers to put your thoughts into the chat and a member of our committee will share that with the, the suppliers that are presenting. The program will conclude with a meet and greet networking session that will be facilitated by our panelists and by our supplier diversity committee members who include in addition to Anu Rao and Kim Castellucci who you will meet and myself Beth Canning, a former supplier diversity manager at Prudential, recently retired. Evelyn Chen, the VP of sourcing at Barclay Bank. George Jimenez, the senior sourcing and global procurement manager at the National Basketball Association. And Maria Jose Wyreth, senior contract and compliance manager at NHA. Um, I'd like to bring up a few housekeeping notes before we begin. Um, because we are in, 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 in allowing an attendee networking mode. We do ask that everyone other than the presenters, please keep your microphones muted, just listen only mode, but we do encourage you to participate by using the chat feature. For the networking session, everyone will automatically be assigned to a smaller breakout room where all the mics will be unmuted for discussion. We will end the program by returning together as a group when all the facilitators will share highlights of their group discussions and we'll have an opportunity again for an open discussion among all the attendees. After the event, attendees will receive an email with links and instructions for applying for continued educational credits. We look forward to spending an exciting next couple of hours together. We encourage you to participate via the chat and during the open discussion segments. It is now my privilege to introduce our keynote speaker, Nathan Ayers, Prudential's Chief Procurement Officer, Global Sourcing and Procurement Group. Nathan joined Prudential in 2015, where he was tasked with leading procurement transformation and category management. In his current role, Nathan is focused on driving the next level of sourcing transformation at Prudential, including driving data analytics to create transparency and knowledge, leading strategic sourcing that leverages Prudential's total spend in the marketplace, and supporting customer focused solutions that enable the business to react and adapt to the constantly changing external marketplace, as we're all familiar with, all the while ensuring Prudential maximizes value from its supplier and networks. With more than 25 years of experience in procurement, Nathan has held positions within Merck, Thompson Consumer, Motorola, Seagate, and Raytheon prior to joining Prudential. Nathan holds a master's degree in business administration from Astridge Business School and is a qualified member of the Chartered Institute of Purchasing and Supply, both in the UK. Please join me now in a virtual strong welcome for Nathan Ayers. Nathan. Thanks Gladys and, and everyone. It, it feels strange to hear kind of your bio read back out to you and it, it kind of made me smile. So 
I mean, who am I and, and why am I here and, and why do I care about ISM and why do I care about supply diversity? I think a couple of things, um, you know, 25 years, it's, it's, I, was probably, I was probably being cautious. It's now over 30 years in sourcing and procurement and, and you know, I have a passion for sourcing and procurement. So ISM and the ability to be able to learn and network is, is really, really important to me. And obviously with the accent, you can tell um, not native to New Jersey. Um, and so kind of cut my teeth in sourcing and procurement in the UK, hence the fancy Chartered Institute of Purchasing Supply, which is the ISM of uh, the UK, same kind of principles. Um, love learning from others. So, you know, the whole process of networking, being able to talk, understand, learn and give back is really important to me. And as you, as you see through the talk, you know, driving economic impact which I think is a result of good inclusion and diversity and supply diversity is something that, that's really passionate to me about. So that's why I'm kind of here today. Format and COVID. So Zoom, Zoom I find, is actually sometimes slightly more intimate in terms of the conversation that we can have in a presentation. And so I, I want people to ask questions right the way through. I'm going to try and be quick and then we can come back and have a conversation if there are key questions around it. Um, and I feel just in the Zoom, it's a bit more easier to do. I'm not going to flash slides up. Who wants to see slides? I'd rather be looking at all of you as I am now, looking at a lot of friends. Hello, Beth. Welcome. Welcome back. Good to see you again. You're looking good. Um, you know, the only thing I miss, I think, from us being in a room together is, is the networking that you can drive from that. And being English, you know, being able to do that over a beer, which is, is all something that, that appeals to me. So I would say that my door, metaphorically and, and realistically, when we ever get back into the office, is always open, reach out to me, LinkedIn or, or whatever, if you have questions for me. <clears throat> Just pausing on COVID for a bit, you know, I think I'm going to touch on how COVID impacts supply diversity, but I, I, I feel we're in a bit of a, um, a bit of a, impasse almost or a bit of a, a turning moment if you look from a US perspective I really think you know we're kind of turning the corner on 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 COVID but I'm sure most of you are involved in a in global supply chains things aren't good around the world things in India um, are fundamentally very bad in Brazil and and I actually think when you start to think about supply diversity inclusion economic impact what we're seeing, um, rightly or wrongly, is we're seeing a difference between countries that, that have the ability to, to give um, income and have a better infrastructure, being able to provide better for their um, countries than low-income countries of the world that are really suffering from COVID. So to me, it, it feels like a very tough time. I know I'm, I'm not as prepared as I would have liked for this call because I spent basically the last two weeks with our Indian vendors, trying to help them and trying to in, ensure they can go through just dealing with what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis with their employees. Um, so I am looking forward to the new normal uh, of when we're gonna get back into the office and what that looks like, but I, I, do, I do pause for thought around what's happening in the world and what impact that has on us from a supply diversity perspective, and I'll touch on that. So I just wanna to touch on a, a kind of about me for a bit. Um, and give you a bit of a bit of backdrop about about me. So, always in sourcing and procurement, as that has said, multiple different industries over kind of thirty plus years, um, and and always found that I, I I liked procurement. I think because, and I think this is even more prevalent today. If you're in sourcing and procurement, you can really drive a difference in a company, not just in terms of the value that we can drive from our external spend but then really making a difference in supply diversity, economic impact and inclusion. So out, out of that 30 years, I would, I would realistically say the last 15 years, so my time within Pharma at Merck and now at Prudential, you know, I've been heavily involved with supply diversity and, and it really hit home to me as something that I felt very passionate about. And I really feel passionate about it because you know, when I look at the, the population of the, back in the UK or I look at the population of the US or any other country, we're made up a whole range of different people, people that look different, people that sound different, um, people that think differently, people that, that have different biases um, and people that, that um, you know, have disabilities and other areas where they can bring more value than people realise, but they're very different. 
And so being able to, to kind of reach all of those people as customers um, and also as suppliers to me is really, really important. So I kind of embrace supply diversity, um, even though that might sound strange for someone that, that's English um, and, and probably not that diverse. Um, important, I think, within that right the way through, and I felt this, and I'll refer back to the power of one a lot, I really think that all of us in terms of if we're in a, supply, if we're in a sourcing organization or if we're a supplier, the power of one can make a real difference. And what I mean by that is if you're a very committed individual and you want to drive change within, within your company, you really can. And if you can empower others to be very committed behind a single cause, that cause being inclusion, diversity, um, better alignment from a sourcing and procurement point of view, you'd be surprised at the amount of change that you could drive um, by being committed. And so I really like to draw back that, that I think um, we here as a sourcing organization um, have the power to be able to really drive supply diversity and the linkage between supply diversity, economic inclusion, um, so economic impact and inclusion is really, really clear. So to me, by driving one, we're actually impacting all the different facets of that. So if I think about it, I'd, I'd sum it up that, you know, I, I think sourcing value proposition is, is really, really clear and why, why I really care about being part of sourcing. And then for supply diversity, I draw it back to three things. It's drawing the economic impact that we can make to communities. And I'm gonna talk about Prudential next and what Prudential have been doing. It's around driving that culture of inclusion. So the, the all people are relevant of um, gender, race, sexual orientation or disability, um, feel that they're connected and included in a company. And lastly, you know, I think as a sourcing organization, we, we have a responsibility to diverse companies. And so let me talk about that in a bit more detail. I, I think the best thing we can do as, as um, sourcing teams is really ensure that our diverse vendors can compete effectively in the marketplace. Um, I'm one of those people that believe it's really, really important that, that we take time to help our diverse vendors compete. I'm not really believing that any diverse vendor, we're helping any diverse vendor by giving them business that they're not um, capable of doing and not able to compete. But I do think um, I want to give more of my time. I ensure my team give more of their time to diverse vendors to help them compete better. It's not easy being a diverse vendor. Many of them are small. Many of them might not have the financial backing. Many of them might not have a mentor to be able to drive that change. So I absolutely think we have a, a responsibility and a commitment to diverse vendors to help them be more successful um, and to help them compete and win. And I know we all have many examples of those um, diverse providers that have come forward from very small to now very large providers. So just touching um, back, I think, on, on Prudential and what are we doing in, in Prudential right now? So I've been at Prudential five years, five and a half years. I, I, I would say I have to love the goals and ethics of Prudential. I think every company at the moment with what's going on in the US is going through a level of self-reflection about how can we do better um, at inclusion, at supply diversity, at empowering our employees. But I really felt um, at home when I joined, joined Prudential. I, when I say I like the goals, if you look at Prudential, you might think, well, we're just an insurance company. You know, so how can, how can I, Nathan, align to the, to the goals? And it really comes down to a phrase that I've heard a lot within Prudential. And it's um, Prudential makes promises to people in, in times of good. And then we have to deliver on those promises in times of really bad times. And, and I, that really rung home to me that, you know, we're taking on board promises of our customers and then we're, de we're delivering back on those promises when those customers are going through really, really tough times um, or their families are going through really, really tough times. And that really resonated to me that it might sound like we're an insurance company and why does that help? But then when you hear the stories, of some of the people that we're helping, um, I, I felt kind of at home. I think the second thing that, that I found really, really important in, in Prudential is just this longstanding commitment to economic impact. So we've been in Newark for 140 years. 
we're putting a lot of investment into Newark to be able to make Newark be the best that it can do. And, and I think we're now starting to think more broader. So we're starting to look at other areas around the US that need economic impact. So Detroit and Atlanta. And I think the last thing that I would say that I found that that's, um, I've liked that's slightly different in Prudential is that being an insurance company, you know, we take our customers' money and we invest it wisely for them so we can give it back to them um, at later times in their life or their families at later times when they need it. So we have a responsibility to be able to invest that money. That gives us the ability to be able to invest money in diverse vendors, not just our vendors, but in diverse vendors across the whole network. And so, you know, I found it very interesting to be able to bring the investment arm of our company to bear on suppliers, not just suppliers that we're using, but also a whole suite of suppliers to be able to give them access to funds. As you know, I don't know there are probably many um, suppliers on the, on the call. At some point, many of these suppliers need investment to funds and it's difficult to get sometimes being small. And so having that 360 view and being able to be able to bring suppliers in and connect them with the wider net of potential that might want to give them investments, I, I found really, um, really good as an, as an individual to better help that. Um, I think at a CEO level, I, I like the fact that our CEO is committed to inclusion and diversity and supply diversity as part of that. We had our earnings yesterday. Um, our earnings call was this morning. That the, the first slide that our CEO put up was talking about cost savings. So any CEO from a, from a procurement point of view that starts talking about cost savings and calling it cost savings, you know, really, really helps the cause of procurement being fundamental to the business. Quickly following on that was the, the, the commitment around driving a more tran, um, transparent culture around our diversity, around our numbers, around diversity internally, around our pay equity, and also around our, the importance of supply diversity and how we change that over time. So having a CEO and that, that top level commitment um, really matters to me. And then I think if I, as I come down further, it's um, being able to have the true and open conversation around diversity and support. And so that covers, um, you know, we have many BRGs, probably as many of you do, and I sit on many of them. But, but I like the fact that when we're talking about diversity, we're talking about race and race. And I always struggle through this word, ethnicity, um, color, um, sexual orientation, gender, people with disability, veterans small local businesses, and, and finally neurodiverse and, and, and autism, something that if you look at my LinkedIn, you'll see that uh, I'm pretty close to, because I have, um, I sit on the spectrum myself being neurodiverse and I have two kids with autism. So I definitely like the fact that Prudential is looking holistically at, at what diversity is. And overall our stats, um, you know, two billion spend in the, in the US, we are in other places around the world, particularly Japan, but we tend to be fairly small in other countries and, and driving about a 7% diversity rate at the moment. So I'm just going to touch on um, what's happening in New Jersey, Newark, and then I'm going to say, well, so what? So what am I doing differently as, as CPO and what do I care about? Um, if you look from a New Jersey point of view, I don't know if all of you know, but Governor Murphy made a commitment alongside nine of our uh, companies that have the biggest footprint in New Jersey to be able to change the profile of diverse spend in New Jersey and also increase the amount of employment in New Jersey. So this was kind of um, about four or five months ago. Um, Prudential was one of those companies, Merck, Ken Frazier, um, who's now retiring, was a second, J&J, Pearsney G, um, Campbell Soup, and I can't remember all nine. But we all jointly committed to, to drive a further $250 million worth of diverse spend into New Jersey by 2025. And on top of that, to drive 30,000 um, new jobs into New Jersey by 2030. And as the nine companies, and we're coming together on a regular cadence to be able to talk about how we're going to do that, how we then um, interest other companies at joining us so that that $250 million can go up from there. And layer that in with, we're also doing the same thing at Newark as well. So within Newark, we have something called the, the Newark Anchor Collaborative. Um, kind of cute name for all the companies in Newark 
are doing the same kind of thing. We're trying to drive um, more spend to vendors within Newark. So 20% increase by 2025. Now, when you look at that, those sound like fairly big numbers. And the question is going to come and the, the area of my focus is um, we might find that we haven't got all the vendors that we need in New Jersey and in Newark to be able to deliver on that. So not only am I looking about how we um, bid more business and how we bring more diverse suppliers in, I'm looking about how we create through the ability to access funds and real estate and the ability to be able to influence the government at a New Jersey level and a Newark level, how we make it really attractive for diverse companies to want to be in New Jersey and to want to be in Newark to be able to service New Jersey and Newark based companies. So to me, it's, it's taking it to the next level and thinking about not just about how we drive more spend, but how we create a more attractive environment for diverse companies to be close to us in Newark and New Jersey. Um, and it's kind of all summarized by the, by the buy, hire and live local kind of banner from a, both from a new, new Jersey and a Newark perspective. So just lastly, I'm just going to touch on, you know, okay, well, with all of that, what am I going to do different as CPL or what am I focusing on and what are my concerns? Um, the first one I'd say is we're going through a major transformation at, at Prudential, which is good. So that raises the profile of procurement. Um, and part of that transformation is also an increased commitment to diversity and inclusion at all levels, including supply diversity. But then you come into the, the challenges that we're currently facing, and I know many of you are facing the same, COVID. So COVID's a driver of change. For, for Prudential, we don't actually make anything. We're a service-based company that um, basically... Uh, manages money for our customers and uses people and services to do that. So we're going to increase our work from home. Um, we're never going to go back to the same way we were. We're going to have less office space. But I do believe, um, and of course, post COVID, that that office space is going to be more densely populated and better used. And that we're going to create a more collaborative environment in the spaces that we're in. So our commitments to New Jersey, our commitments to Newark and other key areas around the tri-state are not going to change, but you know we're not all going to be in the office the same amount of time. That impacts what my spend looks like, and I saw that from 2019 to 2020 in the profile of spend. Secondly, $750 million is the saving that we've committed to the street. My OPEX is coming down, or Prudential's OPEX is coming down. How do I drive up diversity while I'm driving down operational expense? It almost feels like the perfect storm. Realistically, to do that, it's around driving a lot of enhanced analytics. So we spent a lot of time building our analytics capability, not just at a spend cube level, but at a diversity cube level, so that we can do real-time tracking on our performance with vendors from a diversity point of view. We can track by category and do trending. And more importantly, where we're just moving to is we can track by business. Um, so whether it be the sales organization or whether it be an internal um, organization such as HR or legal. And I, we can even track by business leader. So how much spend does that leader lead and is their spend going up or down from a diversity perspective? The reason that becomes important is because, because we've got the senior buying at a leadership level to be committed to diversity. What we now intend to do, and, and hopefully Janine's smiling because she's doing all the work, is, is taking it to the next level of, of then holding the senior leaders accountable for their numbers and creating transparency that, that here is your numbers in diversity within IT. Here are your numbers in diversity within your global insurance business. Um, it's going down, it's going up, here's why it is. How, how are you going to change that as a leader and how do you give my team the platform to help you do that? So that's kind of, it's a phase shift. And it comes back to sourcing and procurement power of one. No one else is going to do this in the organization outside of, of sourcing and procurement. And so we really are the instigators of that change to be able to drive a higher level of accountability. Every time that we go to a senior leader, they're not going to say no, they're bought in, but we need to help equip them with the right tools to be successful. And the last two things that I would say, you know, on, on my radar of what I need to do to be able to help do that is I need to champion suppliers. So I, I need to continue and my team need to continue to mentor suppliers. I think many of us could show successes where we've had small suppliers that have grown exponentially within our businesses. 
Um, that's a really good thing. And then when we have that, we should be celebrating that success. So celebrating it internally so that they can grow internally and then celebrating it externally with panels like this or other panels on New Jersey or Newark or other areas where I can then share success across multiple different businesses and then publicize it both internally and externally. And the last thing that I think the thing I touched on is to be successful, we have to move from tactical to strategic. So I need the strategic relationships around how do I help um, diverse vendors increase their investments and be able to get better access to cash? How do I convince them that Newark and New Jersey is a great place to be? And so that's kind of what's on my radar screen at the moment. Um, probably all I had to cover. Gladys, is that good for you? Hopefully that leaves some time to get some questions. Great, there's time. Um, trying to see if there are any questions in chat. Um, Ju Julie Levy says, amazing work Prudential's doing. Thank you for your continued support to diverse suppliers. Um, Randy Goldberg says, bringing in people to New Jersey is a real challenge, given that we have most people leaving the state. I don't know if that's something you might want to address. Um, yeah, let's take them one at a time. That that's right. that's a challenge, you know. So I, I think um, the commitment was made uh, at the back end of last year, deep in COVID. Um, we didn't know what the future looked like. So you know, I think the nine K co companies that made the commitment were taking somewhat a step in the dark, but a step in the dark around we're doing it for the right reasons in both employment and. Uh, and supply diversity. So I think we're now starting to come together to say, how do we drive that difference? I, I definitely think um, in a safe environment, so I'm trusting you all that it's a safe environment, that, that as a, cumul a cumulative nine companies or more, um, we might need to go back to the government to say, we expect you to be able to do more to make it easier for companies to stay in New Jersey. You know, we can't do this all on our own. You know, the commitment was a commitment by us and you as the governor, we need your help, governor, to be able to help us do that. But I think we need to quantify what those things are to make it make it work. But I agree, we have many people leaving at the moment. Right. Um, there's a comment from Suresh Rathmaton, as cars become self-driving, where do you see the future of insurance? Good question. Um, luckily at the moment, and I say at the moment because um, Prudence is going through a strategic change, we, we don't manage car insurance. <laughs> but I think, it's gonna, I think it's gonna be a very interesting one for that. And I'm just glad that I'm not involved in it at present until someone else gets the answer. Question. Julie Renninger, do you wanna type your question in? I saw you had your hand raised. So that was actually just a hand clap. I said, go Nathan, put New Jersey to work as well. <laughs> Thank you. Ah, so question that says, could you please reshare the name of the Newark collaborative group that's helping increase spend of vendors from Newark? That is such an amazing commitment. Whoops. Newark really is a gem next to New York City with so much potential and recent community involvement. Definitely, and we can, we can share more afterwards. It's called the, the Newark um, Anchor Collaborative. I don't know who came up with that name, but it's pretty good, Janine. But we can definitely share. It's been running for a while. So we had a couple of turns at this based, I think, from a study done in 2015. And interestingly, you know, what, what we're now kicking off at a New Jersey level is actually taking a lot of what we did in, in Newark to then take it to an, another level across the whole of New Jersey. And that's really saying that the you come back, it comes back to the power of one. The people that are talking are, are the CPOs and we're getting in a room saying, how are we going to drive a difference? And we've had successes and, and failures. You know, one of the, the earlier, earliest, I wouldn't say failures, let's call it challenges, is we found um, like many of us are very different companies. So, you, you know, um, we were on a call last week with, the CPO of j and J, the CPO, me, the CPO of um, Campbell Soup and the CPO of PSNEG. We haven't got a lot of suppliers that are common um, when you look across that supply base. 
So, you know, doing supply days where we're putting up supplies, it might work for some service-based organizations. It might work um, between Verizon and Pearson EG because they have a heavy bias on construction and doing work. But, you know, it doesn't necessarily work when I look at my supply base versus Pearson EG or um, say J&J. But that commitment to be able to drive a platform, to be able to drive that cumulative power of all um, that spend together is something we're looking at ways to be able to improve. Okay. Um, there are a few companies that are specifically asking if they could come work with you, which I think we will do offline. Um, then there's a question from Anu Rao who says, can you speak to the supplier diversity work that is being done in Atlanta and Detroit? Sure, and we're just starting with that one. So, so it started from a conversation around, um, I guess it, it started, I'm looking at Deneen, was it a push from us or was it a push from uh, our internal? But, but we, were, we were really questioning, okay, we're doing a lot of work for um, Newark. We're doing a lot of work for New Jersey. Um, that's really, really good. But the, the US is a big place and there are lots of other people in the US that are suffering. Um, if, if we're being truly inclusive, can we just say we're doing work for Newark and New Jersey? It feels counterintuitive. Yes, I think it's our home. Yes, we should be doing stuff. But what about all these other underserved communities? So it started there as a connection with um, our internal organization called Inclusive Solutions, which is then backing it through to be able to look at uh, the investment portfolio. And when we look at the investment portfolio, we might then be able to build in from a supplier perspective. Yeah, and the only thing that I would add to that, Nathan, is um, the organization that the Newark Anchor Collaborative is partnering with has also done work in, um, I believe it was definitely Detroit, but perhaps Atlanta as well. But they're really looking at, you know, as Nathan mentioned, what is the spend for the various companies? What are the suppliers that are there headquartered in, near, and then local to? And then they try to help the companies in the area build those strategic plans, and then at the same time, attract those companies to the area so that you can almost have a match of what the corporations need and what the suppliers sell. Um, so we actually have our, our meeting tomorrow to talk about the findings from um, the benchmark study that was done um, specific around Newark spend. And as Nathan mentioned, it had been done um, a few years back as well. So that work definitely, definitely helps us to you know, understand where we are as it relates to our peers in the region, as well as what, what's out there as far as opportunities. Okay. Um, whoops. There's a, for, I suggest that the suppliers might want to look in the chat. Rob Gregory is asking for specific small business suppliers in a, in a range of areas. Um, I'm not sure if after the event, we can print that out and distribute that. Um, I don't have to stay for, for Prudential. You know, we're really interested either through myself or through Janine um, in um, diverse suppliers that, that, that we can help and make a fit. Uh, we've taken on a new chief marketing officer. And so I can see some people um, in bespoke marketing companies. It's an area I'd really like to look at. Um, I've had com initial conversations with her about championing diversity. Um, I have conversations with all the senior leaders about championing diversity because I think the more people that champion it, the better. Um, but she was really interested in building up uh, the, her portfolio of supply of diverse suppliers, and she felt it was lacking. So good connection there, and especially connections around local-based suppliers. It's been an area where it's been a struggle in in the marketing area to bring on small bespoke vendors. Um, there's a comment from Raul Mercado, NJITPTAC, saying the New, Jer New Jersey Procurement Technical Assistance Center, PTAC, provides free counseling in addition to training and technical resources to New Jersey-based businesses. Our resources help clients navigate the procurement process to better identify viable sourcing opportunities in government and private sector. And he's providing his link in the chat. So anyone interested, please take a look. Um, and so there's one last question. And then unfortunately, we're going to need to move on. Um, Paul Williams asks, do you have any advice or suggestions about driving supplier diversity programs globally beyond North America? 
It's a good question. So in, in Prudential, we've yet to do it because if you look at the profile of the uh, other countries, we're, we're not in um, that many additional countries that, that focus on it. I can talk about my prior experience in pharma and we did have success taking um, supply diversity global, but, but you have to, um, it's global, but it's local. So and I'll give the instance there. You have to look at the individual laws in every country. So, you know, the, the, the laws around how they interpret supply diversity, um, inclusion and um, exclusion is, is very, very different than France, which is different than Germany, which is completely different than, than Japan. So you can, have, you can definitely have a global strategy but it has to be, okay, depending on what we can do in the laws that are in each individual country. Um, and they're very, very different. So it's, it's a slow process. In, in my last company, how we did it is where we had access and where we had spend and where we were on, had the, the right um, governing laws in place, we drove it um, as hard as we could. Where the laws in the country didn't really allow us to do that, we, we didn't, because obviously that would be breaking the law to be able to do that. Okay, okay. Um, I encourage everyone to read through the chat. There's a lot of good information and questions there. Um, I'm, I'm, after the session, we're gonna see if there's a way to preserve them and maybe share where it's appropriate. But in the meantime, we wanna thank you, Nathan, for your very inspirational and passionate discussion and most of all, for giving us ideas on how to operationalize that passion. Um, really appreciate it. It's a great way to get our day started. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, next up is our sponsor spotlight, um, where we get an opportunity to thank the sponsors who brought today's event to us. Um, and they're gonna, I'm going to introduce them one by one and you'll have a chance to learn a little bit about what they do. I'd like to start by introducing our title sponsor, Daiichi Senko and Kim Castellucci, who present on their behalf. Hi everyone. Uh, I am proud to be a member of this diversity uh, committee of ISM, working with Gladys and this amazing team. I work for da Daiichi Senko, you say DSI, it's a little easier. Uh, we're based in Basking Ridge in New Jersey uh, for U.S. headquarters um, in that big empty building that I visited today. And uh, we are actually headquartered in Japan, but we are global. We have offices all over the world. We're 15,000 employees strong. And uh, when I first started about 13 years ago, we were focused on um, cardiovascular drugs, blood pressure medicines, and cholesterol medicine. Uh, but now we have refocused to oncology, which many pharma companies have done. So um, that's really all I have to say. I'm going to pass it along back to Gladys. Okay. Thank you, Kim. Um, our next speaker will be Lorinda Thomas, who will be speaking about our VIP sponsor, ADP. Lorinda, I know, I saw you there. Oh, there you yes. are. Yes, you see me? Yes. Good. Thanks, Gladys. Good afternoon, everyone. As Gladys mentioned, my name is Lorinda Thomas, and I manage the Supplier Diversity Program at ADP. We are extremely honored to be the VIP sponsor at this year's ISM Supplier Diversity event. ADP is headquartered in Roseland, New Jersey, and we are a comprehensive global provider of cloud-based human capital management solutions that unite HR, payroll, talent, time, tax, and benefits administration. We recognize that creating partnerships with diverse suppliers is a major competitive advantage and a powerful business tool. ADP Supply Diversity Mission is to build relationships with and purchase goods and services from diverse businesses that can help ADP achieve its growth objectives. If you'd like to hear more about our program and what we buy from diverse suppliers, please go to adp.com and search on supplier diversity. I would also love to send a special kudos and thanks and shout out to the entire ISM team for continuing to offer wonderful virtual programming throughout this past pandemic year. So thank you. Thank you, Lorinda. Okay, next up will be Michael Amoroso from Bravo Group Services. Michael, oh, there you are. You have to unmute. There we go. 
Good afternoon and thank you ISM for holding this event. Um, it's a pleasure and an honor to be involved. Uh, Bravo Group Services uh, provides facility support services, um, which means we do mechanical services in New Jersey and we also do uh, janitorial services. We're headquartered in Bridgewater, New Jersey. Uh, we have 4,000 plus employees uh, across the 15 states we service. Um, and I just want to say that uh, Prudential um, definitely uh, does what they say they will do. Um, we, um, for years, worked at a few of their sites. And this last, uh, about a year ago, they awarded us all the sites in Pennsylvania, all the sites in New Jersey. So they definitely expanded their footprint with a diverse supplier. And we are a minority owned, woman owned supplier. So uh, a lot of times I hear a lot of talk. And then when you try to actually uh, follow up on it, it, it doesn't happen. But um, again, Prudential definitely uh, is walking the walk. So thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, and speaking of Prudential, our next uh, speaker is Janine Pidato, speaking about Prudential. Thanks so much. Um, and obviously, Nathan gave you some insight into the program and what we're working on. But to introduce you to myself and give you a little bit more um, uh, specifics, my name is Janine Pidotto. I have um, responsibility for um, what we call supply chain sustainability, which includes a centralized um, group that focuses on vendor governance. We also have a supplier sustainability program and then also, of course, supplier diversity. So um, I do see Beth on the call and obviously Beth was part of our great program uh, up until her retirement. And so happy that she's able to join and enjoy her retirement. But, um, you know, it's really great to be at Prudential um, with all the energy that's going on, specifically as it relates to how Nathan explained, you know, keeping our promises and, and making sure that for individuals um, that there is an opportunity to achieve financial wellness. So I think supplier diversity fits almost perfectly in with that, right? We really want to make sure that we're having an impact, um, you know, in the communities where we do business. And as Nathan mentioned, that goes beyond just Newark, although we do have a big tie there. But, um, you know, what we're specifically doing, um, as Nathan mentioned, there's a lot of work with our spend analytics. And so we're able now to slice and dice the data to tell a business lead or a category manager or a uh, you know, name your person in the company, how to be accountable um, for the choices that you're making as it relates to um, diverse suppliers. And then as the, uh, you know, as it, you know, it holds true is once we make those relationships, we really want to ensure that we're able to build and grow on, on, on that partnership. So it's really exciting to see, um, certainly lots of work, but great energy and a lot of great enthusiasm across the company. So it's awesome to be here. Thank you, Janine. And you're right, we're lucky we have Beth on our committee. Um, next up will be J.D. Palandrano from Novartis. Hi, thank you. Yeah, I'm J.P. Palandrano with Novartis Pharmaceuticals. Uh, those of you that don't know, Novartis is a global pharmaceutical company based in Basel, Switzerland. We do have our U.S. headquarters here in East Hanover, New Jersey. So I am the U.S. Uh, sales and CSO category manager for Novartis, where I've been for the last three years uh, working with Richard Brink. I'm also the interim supplier diversity manager as our previous person recently retired. Um, I'm pleased to be here today to support ISM and Novartis' commitment to small and diverse supplier inclusion. I look forward to this afternoon's supplier pitches and meeting more of you in the networking session. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next is Robin Best from Johnson & Johnson. I know I saw you. I'm here. Hi, everyone. Uh, nice to see your smiling faces. I'm the supplier diversity program lead. Uh, at Johnson & Johnson, uh, headquartered in New Brunswick, New Jersey. And we are a global multinational um, healthcare, uh, broadly based, um, covering pharma, medical device and consumer products. And um, our supplier diversity and inclusion program is now in its third decade. Uh, we um, have expanded our program to 17 countries globally uh, thus far. And just really pleased to uh, be a sponsor of this um, meeting today. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
Robin, would you be willing to talk to some to those who are wondering about expanding their supplier diversity program abroad? I I can speak to that um, and or uh, help to identify the right person to talk with. Absolutely, I'll, I'll put my uh, contact details in the chat. Thank you. That's wonderful. Um, and then last but not least is Mary O'Leary from Fair Market. Hi, thank you for having us. Um, very simply, Fair Market's an intelligent sourcing platform. We connect with customers' ERP or P2P systems uh, designed to enable purchasing teams to increase the amount of spend that they impact via automated sourcing uh, with a very specific focus on the meat of the tail and the long tail without having to add headcount. Uh, the fun piece and how we can help with supplier diversity is intelligently and systematically inviting relevant, diverse, and sustainable vendors into sourcing events without having to add any additional work for a purchasing professional. Uh, we've found that the meat of the tail and the long tail, where it's less strategic and less complex, is often a fantastic area of spend to really push the envelope and impact diverse and sustainable goals. Uh, some of our partners in the space are Ecovadis and Supplier.io. And a lot of what Nathan was saying about sort of getting leaders to hold and be accountable to diversity numbers, it resonates with what we're trying to do is enable those leaders to uh, hit those numbers. I'll put my information in the chat. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. And again, we want to thank our sponsors and appreciate their um, support of the program. Um, now, in or next up will be um, our supplier showcase. And I would like to introduce Anu Rao from our supplier diversity committee, who will kick off the um, who will kick off the showcase. Um, Anu Rao is the director of business development for Indontrinex Avani Group. Anu has been an ISM New Jersey director of membership for the last three and a half years. And along with Kim Castellucci has been the co-chair for ISM New Jersey's Women in Leadership Committee. And it's acclaimed annual event for two and a half years. Anu has been an active member of the Supplier Diversity Committee for over five years. Anu has been the recipient of the Institute of Supply Management New Jersey's Volunteer of the Year Award for outstanding contributions on the various committees notably supplier diversity and membership. Please join me in welcoming Anu. Thank you so much, Gladys. That was such a flattering uh, note about me. Thank you. Uh, the ISM New Jersey Supplier Diversity Conference is definitely one of my favorite events of the year. And I'm so glad to be on the committee uh, under uh, under you, Gladys. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed Nathan's keynote address. It is so rare to hear such sincere commitment to supply diversity from mentoring to actual opportunities and uh, the ability to bring influence to state governments and cities like new work that they operate in. Uh, truly inspiring. Thank you once again, Nathan. Uh, and now I am so excited to introduce the next part of the programming the Supplier Showcase. So four diverse suppliers will have the opportunity to give their sales pitch to a virtual room full of sourcing and procurement executives. Now that is a dream come true for most of our suppliers. Furthermore, these four suppliers will receive feedback from a panel of three expert judges, which will help these suppliers make their pitch even more effective. Before I hand over the stage to the judges to introduce themselves, I wanted to share one fun fact about each one of them. And uh, I'll start off with Joy Wang from New York Life Insurance. So she says the virtual work environment during the pandemic has made her take the courageous decision of showing her true colors, true hair color. And I just love it. It's just so empowering. Uh, she also has worked in just one corporation throughout her career. Now, I don't blame her because New York Life is the number one largest mutual insurer in the U.S. So, Joy, uh, I, uh, great to have you on the panel. Uh, next up is Paul uh, Williams from Mondelez. Yes, that is the same company that makes Oreos and my son's favorite Enjoy Life cookies. 
So a real fun fact about him is he paints portraits and writes short stories in his spare time. I don't know how he gets spare time. He's a father of three girls. Uh, he, uh, okay, this is fun. He once uncovered 51 large fossilized dinosaur tracks. Go figure. I have to ask him if it was when he was a youngster. Um, and the next up is Willie May of Covenant Business Solutions. Now, as a supplier herself, she knows how to present an effective business case. Now, I can say that because I myself have had the good fortune of learning from her. Thank you, Willie May. And the fun fact about her, she once tried ninja school. So she looks peaceful and kind, but be careful. Um, so thank you to each one of you for spending the afternoon with us. And now I'll hand over the virtual stage to Joy. Where'd you go? Joy? Oh no. Did we lose her? <laughs> she was just here. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, audio now. Oh, uh, oh, she's waiting to be let in, Kathy. Joy got. Uh... I put her in. Okay, awesome. It's been a minute. The joys of virtual networking. Welcome, man. It was such a wonderful introduction. I hope she heard it. <laughs> Thankfully, Janine, uh, she, uh, uh, Kathy has recorded, so yeah. <laughs> played back for her. Yes. <laughs> she's making a prince entrance. She's making us all wait. <laughs> yeah, she's not actually in yet, so. I, well, while, I, while she's trying to get in, why don't I just uh, mention how we're going to run the, uh, good the uh, good presentations. Idea. So while we did this in person the first time, which was so much fun for those of you that were there, uh, it was a little easier to pop on stage uh, in between our speakers, introduce them and, you know, grab the hook and say, time's up. So we, don't, we can't do that virtually. So we've come up with a way uh, to, and, and I, I think Kathy, you mentioned that either you can pin me or someone else, uh, they can pin me themselves. Um, we have a timer and I will share what that looks like. You all get two minutes and it will cover my screen. And at 30 seconds, there'll be a very faint warning. It won't be any kind of scary loud noises, but when you're done, there will be a nice little alarm. So you'll see the countdown if you pin me but obviously don't pay attention to me all the time. Just uh, do, do your best with your pitches because we're all, as, as Anu mentioned, you have over 90 people online listening, which is fantastic. I'm so proud of this um, night. We used to have it at night. So uh, if, you know, if you need anything, I'm on the side with the timer. And, and, and hi. This is Joy, I'm back. <laughs> I don't know what I missed. I was disconnected for I think a good five minutes or so. So apologies for that. Technology. So Joy, I just finished introducing all of you and okay, uh, I'm gonna play it back for you because I had very nice things to yes, say about please. you. <laughs> uh, so now uh, you go ahead with the introduction, the next part of the program. Very good, thank you very much. So um, I guess I'll start with the keys introducing myself. Good afternoon. It's an honor to be invited by ISM to um, moderate the second supplier showcase. And uh, again, thank you. I managed the New York Life Supplier Diversity Program and for almost 10 years, but I've been with the company for more than 25 years <laughs> and more all caps. So before my current role, I managed the corporate dining program and uh, I've done strategic sourcing projects, which connects me to this event. So um, I've listened to pitches from sourcing, stakeholder and supply diversity uh, advocate perspective. So in my current role, actually, at New York Life, we've hosted at least 10 Shark Tank, Shark Tank like events at New York Life in at least the last eight years. And so, um, and we love this event because, you know, and actually one of those events is even a legal pitch events where they're all 
uh, minority and uh, LGBT owned uh, the law firms actually that participated in that Shark Tank event. And so this supports our uh, supplier diversity advocacy goals. And, and we love this because it really prepares uh, the suppliers in uh, getting ready, getting them ready when it's a real RFP, you know, when it's a real presentation through this event, they it, it would help them uh, polish and, and hone their presentation skills. So without further ado, uh, again, it's an honor to uh, moderate this team uh, judges. And I'd like to start uh, with ladies first, uh, Willie May. Uh, Willie May, I've known her um, actually as a program uh, a curriculum uh, program instructor, manager for several mentorship programs that uh, New York Life has participated in. And so without further ado, let me introduce Willie May first. Thank you, Joy. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. And, and, and as Joy has said, I, I too am honored to have this opportunity to participate in this really um, important ISM pitch competition and, and showcase. And um, my name, again, is William A.B.C. I'm president of Covenant Business Concepts, and we specialize in the creation of business accelerators, centers of excellence, executive education programs, uh, uh, business capacity building programs. And some of our clients include Columbia. As Joy has mentioned, I've done a lot of things for New York, New Jersey Council, NMSBC, for Rutgers, for Ernst & Young, and uh, we just enjoy finding new and creative ways to empower and help grow diverse suppliers. And so it's been a pleasure to be able to collaborate with Joy and Paul and Anu and, and Kathy and, every, and, and many of the people that are uh, in today's session. Thank you. Thank you, Will and May. So next is uh, Paul Williams. Uh, Paul, I've known him also for uh, close to five years, and we actually serve on the New York, New Jersey Minority Supply Development Council board. Um, he is currently our treasurer there, and uh, I was just telling our uh, co-panelists here earlier that uh, we were actually on a board meeting earlier this morning. Actually, there's a few people, I think, uh, that are participating that were part of that meeting earlier today. So without further ado, uh, Paul Williams, uh, if you could please tell them about yourselves. I'm sure. So Paul Williams, I currently lead uh, Global Economic Inclusion and Supplier Diversity at Mondelez. Um, have been in that role, which was actually a newly created role since about um, October of last year. Uh, Mondelez, like a lot of companies, um, increased our commitment to diversity in general and supplier diversity specifically last year. And so, uh, you know, my, my role was created to move us from a primarily North American program to a, a global program. Um, I, I've been involved with um, procurement for 20 26 years and a very strong and vocal advocate of supplier diversity for all of that time. And basically when Mondelez was expanding his program, they said, hey, you've been talking about this, so you own it now. So, um, and I, I was very happy to do that. Um, also very excited to, to, to see the presentations today and be a part of this. Um, you know, one of the things I love the most actually about supplier diversity is seeing the ideas coming from um, new businesses, so very excited. But I have to confess that even if I was not excited, uh, a new and joy asked me and I would be pretty much do whatever they asked me to do. I, I worked with them both for a while. So um, happy to be here. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. So with that, um, I guess we'll start with our first presenter. Uh, we'll start with, uh, I think it's, please correct me, uh, it's L-Team Inc. Um, our presenter is Rebecca Broman. She's a small business owner and an MBE. And uh, go ahead, Rebecca. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Oh, super. Okay, great. Um, good afternoon. Um, I would like to thank ISM, first of all, for the opportunity to present this information to you today on our firm. My name, as you mentioned, is Rebecca Broman, and the company I work for, the name is EI Team Inc. And um, we are a full service architectural and engineering firm. We provide architecture, electrical, HVAC, plumbing, fire protection, 
and structural design engineering services to our clients. Um, I'm basically an executive administrative assistant. I handle the marketing, supplier diversity, human resources. Um, I do a lot of recruiting and I'm a contracts coordinator. So I wear a couple different hats. Um, we have been in continuous business since 1929. Um, we have been under the current ownership and leadership of Dr. Hormoz Mansuri since June of 97 when he purchased it. Um, I've been working for Dr. Mansuri since 93, so I'm going on my 28th year here. Um, but we're, we're proud to be here. And um, as I said, Dr. Mansuri owns the company. Um, we've been certified as an MBE through the state of New York Empire State Development, the New York, New Jersey Minority Supplier Development Council, the city of Buffalo County of Erie, city of New York, New York City School Construction Authority, and the Dormitory Authority of the state of New York as a certified MBE. Um, some of the main items, um, just briefly, I wanna to touch on that we feel sets, oh, I'm sorry. That was your alarm, but you know, we're not so stringent, we can't give you another minute or so. Oh, goodness, that, okay. Um, a couple of main items that sets us apart from our competition. Um, we believe in communication, communication, communication. It's very important uh, within our company and between um, our staff and our clients. Um, our commitment to our clients, the quality review of our product by senior management, and the reasonable value of our product. Um, a few fun facts about our company. Um, for phone calls and emails, our staff is so, um, I should say professional it seems. It seems we're constantly apologizing to our clients for disturbing them. And it's kind of it's kind of funny. Um, we also like to talk with our clients about their interests and um, to start a rapport. And with that, I will end my little presentation. I did provide um, Ms. Perna with a copy of um, our management team, a brief background on our company and some of our service areas, clients and example pro projects if anyone's interested in that as well. So thank you very much for this opportunity. I do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, so with that, uh, this is practice, right? This is a safe place. So with that, I'd like to start with uh, Willie May to, to give you her feedback and thoughts. Yeah, thank you, Joy. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, how are you? Good, good, good. Nice to meet you, and, and thank you for your pitch today. Nice I to thought, meet you. Yeah, I thought that you had um, a really good pace to your pitch, even though you, you ran slightly out of time. You come across in a very genuine and even manner. It didn't feel rushed, and uh, you you presented it in a way that, for me, felt engaging. You know, I wanted to, to, to learn more about your organization. Thank you. I can give you some feedback. Some of what was missing for me was your why. Like, why are you pitching? You know, and if I'm, I'm mistaken, if I'm not mistaken, your company is an architect or construction Architect engineering firm. We do do some construction monitoring type of work, yeah. um, but it's primarily architecture and engineering. So, so I liked when you shared, you know, like who you were in the organization, the history of the, of the organization. You did a really great job of, of unpacking your time with the organization. I would have liked in that two minutes to maybe hear about some success stories about the business, like some things that you've worked on you know, your expertise and then help me link it to, to something that would help me 
um, make it memorable about you and the organization. I want to talk a little bit about your virtual presentation, you know, and pitching because it's a little bit different when you do it virtually. You have to work on your staging. So like around you, your area appears a little cluttered for me. You have okay. papers pinned on the back of you on the wall. There's an umbrella. There's a phone immediately behind your head. And so instead of me focusing on you, my eyes pulled back to your area. So there's an art to when you have to do a virtual pitch stage in your area. So if you look at a new, um, a news staging, she's got a purple background. She's centered in the room and there's very little to pull you back into the room. If you look at my staging, this is by design. And I'm not saying you have to do it this way, but just FYI, I okay. have books to the right, right of me. There's awards in the back of me. So subconsciously, the image that I'm promoting is, you know, um, I like to read, you know, or I have access to knowledge, I'm accomplished. And then I have a plant immediately back here, which means I'm nurturing. So think about from a branding standpoint, what's the branding, right? You're in construction, right? And, and, and engineering. And so there needs to be some precision, right? There's um, integrity of design that should come across. So, and then in terms of your virtual presentation, a real environment, which is what you have, is always better than a faux environment. So, you know, if you put your branding up, sometimes they get the faux branding, like um, with like Bravo, I think one of the, the leaders came on and he had his faux background with Bravo branding. If you know you don't have time to get your staging together, right? Get a faux background and bring that up. Okay. okay, thank you. Um, and I think uh, that that's it for me. I thought you did a good job and, and, and it was nice. I, I just would incorporate those additional things. I hope that was helpful. Very helpful. Thank you very much. I do appreciate it. You're I'm welcome. very nervous, so I, I do apologize. It didn't show. It didn't show. Didn't show. Yeah. Thank you. And Paul? Um, sure. So I, I agree with um, the points that Willie May made. Um, I, you know, I had a lot of the, the same points there. I would agree. I think you did a great job of establishing like an authentic personal connection with people, which is like most important. You know, I think um, if you were nervous, it didn't show. I think in terms of pacing, you 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 were um, you you did not come across as rushed. So I, I would you know when you think about the fact that you you ran over time. I wouldn't necessarily say like speed up. It just means be more selective about the points that you choose to make and really okay. think about like, what are the points that are gonna hook you? So for example, the fact that the company has been in business since 1929 is quite a standout thing. So if I were you, I would try to get that on the table earlier. And then as Willie May said, talk about some of the projects you've been involved with, which yes. will be like establishing kind of credibility. It's almost the same as the, the the awards that Willie May has behind her. So really quickly, we've been in business since 1929. We've done this, this, and this. Um, you know, so I would say, you know, that those are a couple of things. Um, the values I thought was also quite helpful. So I would try to get that in, you know, some of our core values are this, the, you know, these couple of things. Um, I, I also think like because you have so much that's there, um, I, I, if, if possible, you could create a virtual background. I would recommend maybe a virtual background with key facts or something that reinforces what the key points that you're trying to make. Even if you just had a virtual background that says since 1929, you know, delivering quality um, since 1929, that would be like a high impact, you know. So that's just a couple of thoughts that, that I have. Like for, for myself, we're still rolling out economic inclusion and supplier diversity at the company, you know, at Mondelez um, in, in a lot of regions where they're not used to it. So when I present internally, I've got a background that says economic inclusion and supplier diversity, EISD, just so people even know what it is. So I, I would recommend maybe doing that. But overall, I think your presentation style and approach was actually quite, you know, quite good. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the feedback. Yeah, there are great feedbacks from our judges. Um, and I think what I'll that add there is, uh, Rebecca, I, I commend your composure. Uh, you know, knowing that you went over, you, you calmly continued on your presentation and presented what you needed to present. Um, so that's really great. 
I think uh, definitely on the authenticity and being engaging. The only thing that I'll add, uh, I think that um, you mentioned that uh, you know you you are uh, I think uh, an admin assistant. You don't need to say that. You represent the company. You, you it it doesn't matter your role. If you can sell the company, that's what matters. I think you don't need to include that. That would be the only feedback I I could add. Like own it. At this point, you are representing your entire company and that's who you are. And I think uh, that's very important. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Good advice. So and, uh, I, I just want to add, Joy, I missed that she was an ad, admin assistant. I thought she was like an associate or one of the, you know, designers uh, in, in the, the program. And um, so it didn't, it didn't, I didn't catch that. That's so, great. That's good. So you did an amazing job, uh, Rebecca. Thank you. And, thank you and so much. with that, thank you. Uh, I think actually are there uh, feedbacks on the chat? Not no. specific. Okay, it looks like they're just comments at this point. Hmm. All right, so I think we're ready to move with our second presenter. Our second presenter is Event Dex LLC. The presenter will be Durga Michelini. Michelini. Um, again, another small business, small and minority business-owned uh, company. And without further ado, uh, Durga, go ahead. Thank you, Aysen Mujasi. Hello, my name is Durga Michelini. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Event Dex. Eventex is a certified small business based in New Jersey. We've been in business for the past five years. We provide a full-fledged on-site hybrid and virtual event management software for B2B trade shows and meetings. We specialize in serving diversity organizations and providing a one-stop solution for all the needs, including business matchmaking um, and everything in the registration and all the aspects of the event software. Business matchmaking is a powerful tool that is used for many use cases, such as connecting buyers and sellers, small businesses with corporations and government agencies, also for trade missions and investor entrepreneurial conferences. Our on-site suite provides registration, badge printing, check-ins, and mobile apps for the event. After COVID, we actually had to pivot to the virtual environment, so we created a unique virtual platform um, within a very short term. And then that has trade show floor, networking lounge, live streaming and round tables. Our software is used by many diversity organizations such as DA4S, uh, which actually I just saw David there and NMSDC okay. chapters. We work with several NMSD, NMSDC chapters, including EMSDC. And we work with corporate diversity divisions like Abbey, Coca-Cola and uh, American Water here in New Jersey. And we also work with educational institutions such as University of Hartford, Georgia Tech, and Yale. Our diversity certifications include NMSDC and New York, New Jersey small business certifications. And fun fact about EventX is that it started by two friends and roommates from college, NJIT, we both went to NJIT, uh, Durga and my partner Raj. And my wife still thinks that I'm going to have fun and have a good time with my friend as I'm going to work. So that's, uh, uh, we've been in business for the past 25 years, initially providing IT services and then um, providing event management software. We are partners, we trust each other. And if you choose us, we can be your partner that you can trust and count us for a long term. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Durga. Um, so I guess uh, Paul, I'll start this time. Okay, sure. So, um, you know, overall, I think it was a, it was excellent presentation, very clear. I think you did a great job of explaining um, what you do, um, what the business, you know, what business need you're meeting. And then I thought you also did a great job of highlighting um, the pivot that you made, you know, in, in response to COVID. So I think that shows a level of agility for you all as a business, but it also speaks to me as a, as a, buyer to say they're responding to a need that we now have. So I thought that that was, that was um, excellent. Um, 
I, I was at the beginning when when you first introduced you you mentioned that you're a small business, um, but as you spoke later, you highlighted that you're also a certified MBE, and I would encourage you to to highlight both because I was actually even confused for a second: is it just small or is it uh, MBE also? So highlight both. Both are valuable to buying organization, um, and then also I think your time and service is also notable and adds to your credibility. So if I were you, I would actually somehow um, work that in earlier in the presentation, just establishing the credibility of 25 plus years. But overall, great presentation. Thank you. Um, I, I echo uh, Paul's uh, comment. I thought that you did a really great job, um, Durga, in your presentation. Uh, you had really good eye contact. It really didn't feel like you were reading very much. I love the way you established the credibility Without, without sounding as if you were bragging, you know, you did a credibility and then you went right into success stories, which was a good, uh, to Paul's point, you did a nice job with pivoting and explaining the impact um, of COVID. I love your tagline. I don't know if it was a tagline or a little slogan at the end that you ended the pitch nice, which creates a memorable experience. You have a, a lovely, genuine smile and um, a very easy manner that comes across in your pitches. Excellent staging. I don't know if you worked on that or, or what. Love, love the staging uh, in the room. And uh, I think that that was all of my, my notes for you. So good job. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paul and Willie. Uh, I think what I'd like to add there is, you know, you did a great job with time management. I know it's hard when you can't see, you know, the, the countdown. Um, so, and and kudos to the way you ended, like uh, Willie had said, it's memorable. I like that you ended with a fun fact. Um, and more importantly, I think it's important that uh, it's, it's really good that you mentioned some critical clients and critical projects that you've done in that short two minutes. So really good job there. Thank you so much. Thank and and I think there were some a couple of questions in the chat, and and I think we still have time. So um, one comments, good do, good job, Durga, sharing the, the background of your company and services. But there's a one question for you, and maybe you can address this later. It's by Julie Renninger. It says, can production companies send an RTMP stream into event decks? Yes, yes, we work with. StreamYard, Zoom, anybody can stream into our platform. But the answer is yes. Great, thank you. So I think you may reach, you may want to reach out to Julie Renninger to you know continue this conversation if you want to Great. both follow up with each other. Thank so you. with that, thank you very much, Durka. Good thank job. You. Thank you so much. So next, our uh, the next company to present is Bravo Group Services. Michael Amoroso will be doing the presentation. Uh, Bravo is a minority and woman owned business. So go ahead, Michael. Good afternoon, thank you very much. I'm Mike Amoroso, Vice President of Solutions Development at Bravo Building Services. As mentioned, we are a woman owned, minority owned business. We have two lines of business in New Jersey. We offer a full service mechanical services and that is design, repair, install, and maintenance of your HVA systems. We also are a uh, authorized Honeywell uh, dealer for BMS systems. And we work in normal office space. We also work in critical environment, clean rooms, data centers, GMP areas. The second line of business we have is janitorial. We are in 15 states from Massachusetts to Florida, and we do the south central part of New Jersey, of New Jersey of America. We are in Arkansas and Oklahoma. We provide services in just about every vertical. Um, as you know, we do prudential. So we're in the insurance world, cap one in finance, uh, life sciences. We work with GSK, uh, Teva, immunomedics. We work both again in the office space and the GMP areas. We do corporate headquarters, uh, Walmart, uh, Loves, healthcare, uh, we're at CHOP, Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania, Memorial Sloan Kettering, and we do manufacturing. Uh, we work directly with uh, the corporations, and in some cases, we work with uh, FM providers if companies outsource their facility management. 
A lot of it depends on how they want their spend. If they put, put us on their paper, they get tier one. If they go through uh, an FM company, it's tier two. So what makes us different? Well, we're large enough to handle uh, you know, some of the largest uh, companies and projects, uh, complex projects in the United States, yet we're small enough to be very nimble. Um, Karen Martinez, our founder, founded the company 26 years ago. Um, she's hands-on with her husband, Frank, and I guarantee they can talk to uh, you about any one of the clients we have and they'll know what's going on. Um, the pandemic was very interesting for us, but it actually helped us accelerate technology by us introducing things like robotics, sensor technology, validation programs, and artificial intelligence. So if your organization is looking to improve quality, control OPEX, uh, and provide your fellow employees with the peace of mind that everybody's looking for as you re-enter your office space, I think uh, we should talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Two minutes. So, so Willie? <laughs> Thank you, Joy. Hi, Michael. Uh, I, I thought you did a, a nice job. And the thing that was interesting is at the top of the meeting, uh, you were introduced as a sponsor and I was watching you and you were doing a little swaying when you were talking at the top of the meeting. I was like, oh, I hope he doesn't do that. You know, when he pitches and you did a great job, there was no swaying. You really were centered and, and grounded in the moment. So good job with that. I would like to recommend that you mention uh, the owner, Karen, at the top. You, you said it was a woman owned. A lot of people know Karen. And I think that what a lot of people are looking for is, is that immediate connection between you and Karen, right? Because Bravo is an, an incredible team. And I think the thing that I love about Bravo is just the companionship that exists there. And it would be great if we could get access to that. It, it came up a little bit later in the presentation, but it'd be great if it was at, at the top. You did a wonderful job explaining the purpose of the organization, the services, and um, is it, uh, talking about uh, what, you, what you do. And then you said, if your goal is, I thought that that was such a great uh, leading line to kind of wrap up your presentation. If your goal is, then we should talk. Um, the only thing that I would say about that, keep that tagline, just make sure that you punch it up a little bit at the end. It kind of teetered out at the at the end. Thank Great you. job overall, Michael. Yep. So um, I'll, I'll hop in. I, I think um, I, I would echo again everything that Willie May said. I think overall, great job of presenting. Um, really good job. I, I think you, you did a great job of kind of leading folks along the line of why and how they could engage with you. Um, I, I thought it was actually a very good idea that you um, put the whole uh, FM partnership option on the table up front, you know, so if folks have that in their mind, um, you, you're addressing how you can still work together there. So I thought that was great. Um, the highlighting of your key customers was also great. Um, and then to just be really direct about the differentiation, the things that you feel differentiate you was quite positive. Um, and then also at the end, when you talked about how COVID gave you an opportunity to, to upgrade the technology, I thought that was also a brilliant thing because it kind of piqued the curiosity. It did two things. One, it showed that you guys were agile in responding to the the um, to to how to respond to um, the the crisis, but also that you were forward looking when you start talking about things like AI and robotics and stuff like that. That piques people's um, curiosity. Um, we would also agree with Willie May around um, you know Mitch and Karen specifically at the beginning. Um, I think that was a, a good one. Um, and then I, I would say in terms of like the presentation, it's it's um, I, I would if you're doing a virtual presentation, I would think about your lighting because um, you've got a really nice um, background behind you that but because it's predominantly white and then you're in front of it and you've got um, I'm not sure where you're sitting, but you've got. Um, th there's not a lot of lighting on your face. It causes almost like, I call it the, the smoking man effect where you're just like sitting in the shadows. You know, that's a X-Files reference from an old TV show, but you're, you're, um, you're like, it looks like you're sitting in the shadows. So I would just recommend to get a light like right in front of you so that it's not such a contrast between your, you and the background. I appreciate that, Paul. You know what the funny thing is? 
I actually stole from my daughter. Oh, there it is. <laughs> it doesn't seem to fit. I'd have to put it like a halo. <laughs> put it close. Because actually, like, the, when you pulled it forward, that made all the difference in the world. Like, yeah, yeah there you go. <laughs> that, that's perfect. Give it like that. Um, yeah, that, that, that light, like, literally the one foot or so that you pulled it forward made all the difference in the world. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I tried. <laughs> <laughs> nah, <no problem. laughs> but but overall, great presentation. Thank you. So so Mike, it sounds like you just need to step a little bit closer to the light, and yeah. that makes a big difference. <laughs> so, <laughs> so so I guess what I'll add to that is, uh, I mean, definitely, Mike, you showed your confidence, um, and and I'll re and I'll call what uh, Willie said about you you know, with your background, um, you know, because I think that's another uh, promotion for, for your company to have it right there. And the other thing that I'll add is, you know, being able to distinguish the two different services that you, you provide was very good. You separated it. So it wasn't confusing. And um, although I probably would have just a little, slowed down a little bit on when you mentioned some of your clients and, and maybe made a little bit more um, specific examples for each of the two services that you uh, you are providing for this client. So that's the only thing that I, I would add. I, I agree 100%. I was trying <laughs> to not have Kim yell at me. <laughs> <laughs> but great job. So I think well, I'm going to add a couple of uh, inputs in the chat. Uh, I knew Rao said a general feedback whenever I have received feedback from procurement executives, they do like to hear about cost savings too. So I think this is a feedback for everyone. If it's appropriate, I know it's a two minute uh, presentation. Um, that's something that you know uh, procurement folks like to hear. Um, and Junie, Julie Renninger, appreciate if you can share your email address. So I think this is for all the presenters. Please put your email in the chat. So, um, you know, people who are interested uh, could follow up with you because I know Durga, there's a couple of folks that have given their emails there too. Um, so please follow up with these folks. And last but not least, and thank you, Mike, again. Thank so, you, appreciate it. Thank you. So last but not least, I think I wanna uh, use this time to just say like, uh, I, I commend all you uh, presenters for being brave and you know to, to receive this feedback like this. And I can't believe the time is going fast. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Envision to be well. Uh, our presenter is Tammy Williams and uh, they are an MBE, WBE, and a WSB uh, uh, supplier. So go ahead, uh, Tammy. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Tammy Williams, founder and CEO of Envision to Be Well, Inc. Our tagline is save time, more wellness, better health. As was stated, we're a certified minority and woman-owned business. We are a mission-driven digital health and wellness company that's committed to empowering, enabling, and inspiring whole person and 360 degree well being. We were incorporated in 2019, and our app and platform, Envision Well, helps people to live healthier lives with personalized engagement, robust data, and digital, social, and human experiences to support them on their well being journey with a focus on our 10 pillars of 360 degree wellness. These pillars are eating, fitness, finance, health humanity, kindness, mental health, relationships, spirituality, and work. Recent articles and medical commentary are now highlighting the widespread pandemic-driven health deterioration and its potential negative impacts and effects on workplace productivity. These worsening health issues can't be solved through healthcare visits alone. And more and more, the conversation is shifting to the increasing need for comprehensive digital health platforms such as Envision Well. Companies do conduct employee satisfaction or employee engagement surveys, but they don't typically take into account those other factors that help employees perform to their greatest potential. And that is the social determinants of health. It's what makes Envision to be well and our platform Envision Well stand out. And we call this assessment 
KISA. That is K-S-A-A. Why? Because KISA stands for Knowledge, Support, Access, and Autonomy. You need them all for the engagement. So whether you have a current wellness tool in place or not, the KISA assessment provides an output that tells you the gaps missing in your current wellness programs or what you should ideally focus on if you want to move forward with a new program and also provide you cost savings, ideally with Envision to be well. Our ideal customers are self-insured companies and mid-sized businesses because everyone wants, should want their employees to be healthy, total health. Something exciting about us, we just closed on our funding with Ben Franklin Technology Partners. You may know them. They're based on the main line in Philadelphia. And with, this was with their digital health division. We also have signed on new clients in the last month. Finally, I just want to say, stay safe, wear a mask, and envision well, hopefully with Envision to be well. I'm Tammy Williams, founder and CEO of Envision to be well. Thank you, Tammy. That's really great. Um, Willie? Oh, I, I, I'm almost speechless. <laughs> um, I'd like to say, wow, Tammy, wow. Uh, you did a great, you covered a lot of information in a short period of time. You did an excellent job. Uh, great start. I love the reference to the 360 degree wellness. I almost felt, I felt like you were educating me. Uh, very uh, easy manner, steady pace. You weren't too fast. You weren't too slow. You, you talked about Kissa and um, closing Benjamin Franklin. You had a wonderful uh, ending, a, a, a nice ending, good body language. I have to work to, to find some feedback for improvement. And, and the thing that I would say, Tammy, is that your staging was good and that you were centered and anchored. You had a very clean background. However, it was almost too neutral. And um, I would have liked to have seen some type of branding that, that would have helped me. We had your slide initially in the beginning, but there was almost like no color or branding or anything that helped me feel like I was getting access to more of you, if that makes any sense. But other than that, I, did that make sense, Tammy? No, it did. Thank you. Thank you. Are you there? I, appreciate, I appreciate that. Um, I am not in my normal environment. And so even my lighting is a little off because I can tell you, I have lighting set up. I got it all set up, but I'm not where I normally would be. And so I'm, I'm improvising today. <laughs> yeah, you, cool. did a great, you, did, you did a great job for in, improvising. Thank you. And Paul? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I would agree with, uh, with with Willie May. I, I was just um, I thought you did a fantastic job of just establishing your presence like right out the gate. Um, you know, from the beginning, it was really like you, you, you captured the attention. Um, I thought that you did a fantastic job of packing a huge amount of information in, in a very short amount of time. Like Willie May said, I felt like I got educated along the way. Um, even when, when you mentioned like there's 10 pillars, I, I was I was concerned for you, like how is she gonna get all of this in? But you actually were able to nail it and get it get it in there in a way that was clear to understand. I think the, the KISSA concept is a good one. It's a, a good acronym that catches your attention and then you, you're able to bring it around. So I thought it was all, all excellent. Um, you highlighted who your ideal customer is, which I thought was actually, um, that, that's a good thing. And, and then also a risky thing, because the risky thing is like, like I, if, if someone's from a large multinational, they may tune out and go, oh, it's not for me. Um, it's good because you're saying like, okay, this, you know who your ideal customer is, but just be careful that you don't um, prematurely close a door when you're doing that. Um, and then I would love to have heard just a little bit more about just like, how do you actually you know, what's the next step or what's the first step to engage? But other than that, I think you did a fantastic job of putting a tremendous amount of, of information in, in a short time, in a very super engaging way. Um, in terms of the style, one thing I would encourage you to do is, is see if you can make it, and this is like nitpicky, so forgive me, um, it, it, see if you can make it a little bit more conversational because you present it with such 
polish that it felt almost like a, a newscast or a commercial as if I was at the, the person sitting there was not there. So like, think about it, keep that presence, which was amazing, but just dial it down like one notch so that it seems more like a conversation. That would be my only thing. And again, that's like fifth decimal point type of refinement. <laughs> Paul, thank you so much for that. Uh, in case you couldn't tell, I do public speaking. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> I am. Um, Clearly. That, that, yeah, it, it, it just comes across that way. But, right. you know, you, uh, you know this, this feedback is excellent, um, you know, because I, I struggled with, should I say, who is the ideal client? Because, of course, you know, uh, we're putting out quotes right now to some pretty large uh, yeah. companies. Right. Uh, but most of those large companies happen to be uh, self-insured, which uh, is great for us. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, but overall, I think a fantastic um, presentation. Very well done. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Paul. So, yeah, great energy, uh, uh, Tammy. There's a lot of comments there that, that talked about your energy, actually. And great timing, by the way. I wanted to say that I saw Kim smiling because you're the last one and you made it within that two minutes. So congratulations oh, yeah. there. Um, so I wanted to read, I think, uh, you know, amazing flow and energy. That's one of the comments that have that we have there. I'd uh, love that you reminded again, your name and company. Uh, happy persona, uh, Tammy. Um, and that's it. So thank you very much, Tammy. You're, you're our fourth presenter, but I wanted to, and I think, I thank you, the, the four uh, companies that presented today. Um, we, we hope that this benefited you, but I'm hoping too that even more this benefited the participants who are uh, watching this, because that's what the purpose of this uh, event is, to help everybody develop. And I can tell you that uh, during our prep call, I said, like, I can't do this. Uh, and so I commend all of you for putting yourself out there and really working to, to, to help develop your presentation for your companies. And so, again, thank you. Um, and I guess now I hand it back to Gladys. Thanks again for having all of us here. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. Um, I want to echo Joy's comments um, and thank Rebecca, Durga, Michael, and Tammy for stepping up and taking the risk. And I also want to thank our expert panelists, Willie May, Paul Williams, and Joy for your thoughtful and enlightening comments. I'm sure that not only the suppliers on our call that didn't, didn't um, speak, but those of us that are in, in either role also walked away with some gem and some point of knowledge that we can use to improve. Um, it's just, they were terrific presentations and we really thank you all for your time and all your help. Um, I know about everyone else, it's hard to believe we've gotten to this point in the um, program. Um, we're going to quick, pretty soon break out into our networking sessions. I hope everyone decides to participate at this point we're going to be breaking out into small groups with the facilitator. Um, there'll be, um, trying to see what time it is, probably about 10, 15 minutes of discussion. And then we'll all come back as one group where the, where the moderators will share their highlights of their discussion. And it will be an open mic where we can hopefully one at a time ask questions of people that were not in our group. I wanna thank all the participants and everyone for all their, um, well, they're exciting and um, contributions and um, look forward to our next step. Wow, there's a lot in the chat. And um, as I said, please check your chat. There's a lot of good information in there, not all of which we can um, read out loud. Um, you should be seeing a little message inviting you to join a room. And that's how we're gonna start our networking sessions.